You're listening to the Lord's Army Radio Dispatch. The Lord's Army Radio Dispatch is the audio branch of lordsarmy.org, a Christian training ministry. During this weekly podcast, you'll meet individuals on the front lines of battle with the world. You'll meet Christian leaders, pastors, and lay people, all of whom have been used to the glory of God. If you are a Christian, then we encourage you to become an active duty soldier and join the battle that's going on around you every single day. Come join the Lord's Army. If you look on nearly any list of best places to live in the country, you'll likely find Greenville, South Carolina featured prominently. Not too far from the beach, right by the mountains, is a city that is bike-friendly, dog-friendly, family-friendly, a place with some absolutely amazing restaurants. A few decades ago, though, downtown Greenville was economically depressed. Now, walking downtown, you find a vibrant and safe city that absolutely exemplifies a growing economy. The ever-rising skyline is dotted with cranes. Those former slums around the area have been replaced with high-end apartments and condos. It's a great place to be a homeowner, too, because property costs are in a boom right now. My own home has increased nearly 40% in value since we bought it. But there's a problem. According to the latest HUD point-in-time count, the upstate of South Carolina has nearly 20% more homeless persons this year than last. Greenville's a cool place. You know, on the top five and ten list of all these things, right. which is great, but Greenville's also a place of contrast. So that one Greenville, two realities is how it was said. Uh, and we have half of our folks are living in poverty. Children, the number of children who go to school with free and reduced lunch is way too high for a place that is as vibrant economically as we are. As Christians, we can certainly celebrate the financial growth of an area, but we must always be primarily concerned about the human impact. While rising home values are a great thing for homeowners, it presents a problem for those who need housing. And what about those slums I mentioned? Imagine you lived in those. Then one day you're offered fair market value for your low worth property. You move out. The whole area is bulldozed and replaced with apartments or condos that cost nearly five times what you were paying. I'm not suggesting that we need to be anti-economic development. Quite the opposite. Our job as Christian leaders and members of society is to be good stewards of what we have. This means that extracting and increasing value is a good thing. We should expect our lawmakers and policyholders to generate more wealth in an area and to reduce crime rates. Again, those are good things. However, even more importantly, we are always to consider what a change or development means for those most at risk. We are to always consider the least of these. When someone comes along and says that they have a plan to turn an economically depressed area into a wealthy community, we cannot forget to ask, what about the people that live there now? You see, we would all do well to remember the advice in Proverbs 15:28: The righteous ponder how to answer. We should realize that situations are nuanced, and we should understand those nuances before answering. So... Who am I talking with? Well, I'll let him tell. I'm Tony McDade. I'm executive director of United Ministries in Greenville. United Ministries exists to serve and empower people who are on this uh, transformative journey that's individual, but it calls out the best of the community. And it's a journey toward financial self-sufficiency. You see, when it comes to helping those in need, it's about more than just giving out help. When we just give someone our loose change, as Tony says... But if you only do that, it helps you feel good, but it doesn't help the other person. Instead, what people need is real change. Those who are most in need have genuine causes behind being in that state. Sometimes it's a major life event. Realistically, if you had no family or friends, how long could you survive off just what's in your savings account if you were to lose your income? Sometimes it comes from a lifetime of trauma and tragedy. Sometimes it comes from an illness of some sort. Sometimes it comes from poor life choices. Oftentimes, it's multiple reasons combined. Regardless, what people in need require is more than just our spare change. And so our congregations provide the shelter, meals, overnight lodging that's safe and secure, and the community of people of faith, varying traditions, and they do that beautifully. Then we complement that with the social work piece 
that we do with great expertise. And in most cases, families flourish because they respond to the nice symmetry of resources. You may be thinking to yourself that the homeless have plenty of resources already, but... Just imagine how hard it would be to be on the street, a single dad with a daughter. For very good, practical reasons, you can't put a grown man in a children's shelter. Likewise, you can't put a little girl in a men's shelter. So what is a single dad to do if he finds himself in a homeless situation? What about a single mother with older male children? You see, these situations are all nuanced. It's about individuals. Furthermore, it's more than just meeting a person's physical need. It's about helping an entire person. Transformation. And so, I mean, you know, the, the scriptural term, the uh, Greek word is metanoia. Right. Completely turning your life around or having your life turned around by the grace of God. And then through the sense that other people care about who you are and love you unconditionally as you are. We get to sort of, I get part of my calling these days is the actual joy of seeing people of faith come together and open their doors of their physical spaces and their spiritual spaces and welcome in people probably whom they would never have otherwise encountered. You see at the Lord's Army, we are a discipleship ministry. Our goal in everything we do is to make you more like Christ. You as a born again Christian have a ministry of your own. That's the reason that you don't just kill over dead when you're made a new creature. You're made a new creature so that you can help others. That's the two great commandments. The first is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is to love others. Loving others means caring for them physically as well as spiritually. And it is really only the church, the body of Christ, that can do this work to the fullest extent. Um. I was serving a church in North Carolina in Statesville and got very involved with our local shelter for homeless people. And uh, that became a, a very important part of my personal calling as a Christian, as a human being, and as a minister, so that it, it struck me that congregations are uniquely situated. They are the social organization probably best suited toward helping people holistically. And that includes a spiritual component as well as social and emotional and physical financial, psychological. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, completely changed his area of London, and then from there, ultimately changed a good chunk of the whole world by ministering to the body and the soul. He said this, It is primarily and mainly for the sake of saving the soul that I seek the salvation of the body. The idea that ministering to earthly lives is less holy than ministering to the spirit. That is a carryover from past heresies like Gnosticism. Never forget who gave us physical bodies and physical needs. Never forget who designed us in such a way that it is impossible to function to our full capacity when we lack shelter, food, and our most basic needs. God made us body and spirit, and to be effective ministers of the gospel, we must care for both. You know, a child doesn't learn well at school if he or she shows up at school physically hungry and feeling dislocated mm -hmm. from the world. We understand that in, in the church context, you know, with in the same ways that faith works. So providing for people's basic needs creates an opportunity for conversations. When you truly care for others, it's a blessing for you. After all, it's the whole reason why we're on this earth to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How do we glorify God? Well, we do as He has commanded us, and we serve the ones that He created. And that's every single human being that we can help. Every person we have the ability to help. To share a meal together and find that God is very active in that and the transformative power of that, especially around a dinner table. Mm -hmm. cannot be overstated so that everybody's life gets changed in some way or another. If you're doing hospitality right, the impact is reciprocal. It's not just there's one person being a guest and one person being a host. Those roles get mixed up. Right. And when that is happening, you're doing it right. This kind of communal love is what our Lord modeled for us. And it's what we are to show others. We must be open to others and willing to do what it takes to serve Him by serving them, by truly caring for them. The good news is that there is a promise given to us at the end of Philippians 4. 
At the end of that chapter, Paul mentions that some are given excess and others are given need, so that the giver may be blessed in the giving and the receiver may be blessed in the receiving. There is a blessing to those who are in need and there is a blessing to those who are giving. There is no blessing, however, for an apathetic in-between. Welcoming the stranger takes a great deal of effort on the part of the person doing the welcoming, and it means you risk something. Mm -hmm. You could be changed in your presuppositions, you know, about what, how people got into, uh, into poverty. Right. Uh, you know, there's some folks who feel like the causes of poverty are purely personal that it's some personal deficiency. Others might think it's purely structural. There's some societal issue that perpetuates poverty. I think the, as Reed Lehman says from Miracle Hill, it's probably both, you know, and then the only way to tease that out is to get to know people and one by one begin to create access to resources that Greenville's blessed with. If we can just be the connect, I think the, the church, and people of faith can be the connecting tissue to support agencies and initiatives in the community to help people out of poverty and to get people to connect with them. That's much more important than giving, slipping someone five bucks at the QT, Right. in my estimation. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. And we are simply not being in the world when we fail to engage with others outside of our social groups. If we stay inside our social echo chamber, engaging only with people that are exactly like us, or think exactly like us, then we are not going to be a very effective minister of the gospel. Remember, our Lord certainly engaged with those on the fringe of society, so much so that the Pharisees questioned him. And how did he respond? Our Lord reminded them that it's the sick that need a doctor. It is those outside of the Christian faith that we are called to minister to. If we only interact with the disciples of Christ, then we're certainly not going to be able to be faithful to make new disciples. And making new disciples is a task we are exactly commanded to do. I'm a devotee of the German martyred pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah. Um, and part of the quotation that he had in a way of that organizing life and faith and as a way of approaching faith uh, is a, a statement that goes something to the effect that uh, God is not a timeless fate, but that God waits for and answers sincere prayers and responsible actions. So I think that's our task, is somehow integrating our spiritual practices and our physical practices mm -hmm practical uh, ministry right. in the community and doing that in a way that it works completely in sync rather than as two segments of someone's life or faith. You right. know, the people that I know who are the most devoted to Christ, most um, godly in the best sense of the word, are those who have found a way to put those two pieces together and live their lives in a spiritual symmetry. That's the challenge. Amen. And that is your challenge today. Actively be on the lookout for opportunities to help others. To truly help others. Pray for those opportunities. And always consider the human impact of any and every action, political or otherwise. A special thanks to Dr. Tony McDade from the United Ministries here in Greenville, South Carolina. If you would like to hear the full interview between he and I, you can do that on our YouTube page. This concludes this particular dispatch from the front lines of the Lord's Army. If you want more information or content, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and on Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube. Apply what you have learned in this episode. Remember, you do not become a great man or woman in Christ without taking action. One easy way you can help spread the gospel right now is by subscribing to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, just by liking us and leaving us a review, you can have a massive impact in how many people we reach. Go out there. Take action. Join the battle. LordsArmy.org.